Um, that was great advice and, uh, and, and very concrete, but what about dreams? Don't we all dream to become the next Steve Jobs? Is anybody out here who doesn't want to become the next Steve Jobs? Who wants to become the next Steve Jobs? I want to hear some voice. Raise, very few hands. Wow, guys. Well, you should get excited because we brought to you someone who really believe that the next Steve Jobs is coming out of Cairo. And her book, From the Other Side of the World, talks about extraordinary entrepreneurs in unlikely places. And now she's here in Cairo. So put your hands together for the author and co-founder of FP Interrupted, Elmira Bayrasli. <laughs> you have all the time of the world. You're bringing us. We're having tech problems. Yeah, you're bringing us the best news. So yeah. enjoy the stage. All right. Wait, I, I got to put this on. All right. Hey, rise up. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. I still can't get this pinned on. I'm just going to hold this then. Um, so this is this question of, of um, can you, can you, I'm going to do next. We're having a little bit of technical difficulties. I don't have a clicker. So next. So there's this question of where is the, oh, you know what? I need my little cards. Where are my cards? So there's this question of where the next Steve Jobs is going to come from. So everybody's always asking this question. And most of the time, everybody's only just looking at Silicon Valley, right? Silicon Valley, if you had an idea, if you had an idea to, for it, you know, a, something new, something disruptive, you went out west. You went out to this place where people, were, whether they were engineers or techies or IT people, came together and they were all about the new. You know, Silicon Valley was the place that you went to to actually make your ideas real. Because um, very, very few places, even in the United States, that, where you could actually do that, where you could take a totally radical idea and you can scale it up and you can get people to fund, fund your startup. So I, I said, okay, well, what is the secret of Silicon Valley? Everybody's always wondering, you know, where's, where's the next Silicon Valley? What is the secret? How do you replicate Silicon Valley? And if I had a dime for every, every time I heard that, I'd, I'd be a VC. Um, and so what I decided to do was I decided to research this. I thought, okay, well, I'm going to go around the world and I want to see what is the secret to Silicon Valley. Um, and what I found is that the thing that really distinguishes Silicon Valley from places like Cairo or Amman or Beirut or Istanbul or Bangalore or Beijing is not necessarily the talent or the ideas. It's the obstacles. It's things that are standing in people's way that are preventing them from taking an idea to scale. So the, the obstacles that I found that were most common around the world were talent, a lack of talent, and by that I don't mean a lack of talent where people didn't have ideas. I'm, by that I mean people who are trained and skilled to go in at every level of a startup in a business to um, understanding management and doing human resources and having the incentive to actually come to work and it, like bring it your all. Um, poor infrastructure, a lack of space, monopolies and the lack of competition because I think that's a really big problem whether it's in Asia, Africa, Latin America or here in the Middle East. I think corruption is a huge obstacle that stands in the way of entrepreneurs around the world. Um, poor governance. Um, I think government you know, in, in general, if it's, if, it's not, if it's not doing its job, which is to uphold the rule of law, you're going to really see a big problem with entrepreneurs being able to scale up their ideas. And of course, the status quo, you know, things as they are, because it's, it's really hard to go up against the establishment. So I found that these are, these are the um, obstacles. And in my book, I talk about how entrepreneurs around the world, and I, I profile entrepreneurs from Turkey, Nigeria, Pakistan, Mexico, India, Russia, and China. And I talk about how these entrepreneurs are overcoming these obstacles. 
I want you to read my book, so um, I won't tell you how they're doing it. But what I wanted to do today is I wanted to share three lessons about what I took away from writing this book and what I actually realized was the key to to becoming the next Silicon Valley, but also where, why I actually believe that the next great innovator and the next Steve Jobs won't come out of Silicon Valley. It w that he or she will come out of um, s somewhere like Cairo, Beirut, or Amman or Istanbul. So the first lesson was about focus. And I learned this lesson in a lot of places, but it really hit home for me when I was in Nigeria. In Nigeria, I profile an entrepreneur named Tayo Visu. He runs a company called Paga. Paga is a mobile payment company. And when I went to Nigeria, um, everybody had told me, you know, one of the biggest problems that Nigerians have is that their the, like, lack of banks, lack of a financial system. And, you know, it, it, people are in rural areas, they can't send money. And a lot of this is because that you have really poor infrastructure. The roads are bad, the bridges are corroded, the waterway, the water ports, they're outdated. Um, I certainly know that my experience in Lagos where I was staying at the hotel, the, the electricity would go off pretty regularly and I was actually quite surprised at how frequently the electricity went off. And I thought, wow, you know, how do you run a company in a country where you have such poor infrastructure? And so I spent time with Tayo and I thought, okay, he's helping Nigerians overcome this problem of where they can't get from point A to point B, right? And he's helping them move the money. So I went out and I spent time with his staff, but then also with the, um, the agents. So the way that, that these mobile money, um, these mobile money uh, startups work is that because there's no banks, people have to be able to cash in and cash out. So I love when everybody talks about in the United States that we've got mobile money and the mobile phone is going to revolutionize Africa and it's going to help them leapfrog. Well, it's going to do that so long as your mobile phone is charged and you're able to do that because people still have to figure out how to actually physically get money in and out. And it was when I was visiting these agents that I actually realized how important focus was. And what I realized is that the real problem that Tayo is addressing was not poor infrastructure. So you could still go into Nigeria and you could pave the roads, you could fix the electricity, but until someone could actually figure out how to solve the payment problem and create a financial system that everybody belongs in, Nigeria was never going to move forward. In Nigeria, more than 80% of the population it does not have a bank account. And this inability to have a bank account forces people to actually have physically money on themselves. So they're either holding on to money or wanting to give it away because when you have all this money, it's insecure and people don't want to hold on to money. Well, what happens in that situation is that money doesn't turn out to be an asset. It's not something to be leveraged. It's something that's transactional. And what I realized in visiting these agents and watching these individuals cash in and cash out and actually talking to these people using the mobile money, they said that for the first time, they were actually able to put their money somewhere where they weren't afraid and to actually create data where they're actually tracking what they're spending on and how they're using their finances. And I thought here is something where focus is essential because Tayo wasn't solving the problem I thought he was solving, which was poor infrastructure. He actually dug deeper and he realized what the true problem in Nigeria was the lack of a financial system. So my takeaway here is if you're not solving, if you're, if you're solving a symptom, you're never going to go to scale and you're never going to get anywhere. You really need to dig deep and really understand what is the true problem that you're solving. So my next takeaway is that um, everybody's all excited about technology and techies. Um, and what I realized is that technology has enabled people, whether it's here in Egypt, throughout the Middle East, Asia, Africa, and Latin America, to actually gain control of their own incomes and to be able to start companies, whether it's um, Kareem, the Uber-like company, or e-commerce companies, and to be able to sell 
to sell things to one another. So technology has enabled people to become entrepreneurs, but technology itself has not revolutionized or, or done anything. And what I actually realized, um, I came to realize this was in, in, in Turkey, which is the country where my parents immigrated from to the United States. And I spent time with an entrepreneur there named Bülent Çelebi. Bülent runs a, um, a technology company called AirTize. And what AirTize does is it creates Wi-Fi routers and set-top boxes where, so that you can go and watch Narcos, which is like a really awesome Netflix uh, series, so I highly recommend it. Um, and so he, he was, um, Bülent, like me, had immigrated to the United States. He was, out in Silico he was out in San Francisco. He got an engineering degree at the University of California at Berkeley. And he got jobs in Silicon Valley. And he was a CEO of a microchip company in Silicon Valley when, when Wi-Fi was invented. And he had gone out and he had talked to a number of the companies that were making these Wi-Fi routers. And he said, hey, you know, are you thinking about taking this to scale and, and taking it abroad? Because if you are, I know something about my home country in Turkey where I know that your Wi-Fi routers aren't going to work the way that they do here in the United States. And that technology was a mesh technology, which I know that you used here in, in Egypt during Tahrir Square. And the mesh technology, um, rather than sending a sing, single, single um, radio wave, allows people to communicate and pick up Wi-Fi wi -Fi communication through these pings. And he thought he's going to set this company up where he's going to create Wi-Fi routers um, with this mesh-enabled te technology. Everybody in Silicon Valley told him, you know, we're not interested in doing this. Um, you know, this is not something that we're interested in doing. And he thought, well, I am. And I'm going to go back to Istanbul, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build this company in Turkey. So he raises $300,000, which is actually not a whole lot of money um, when you're thinking about creating a hardware company. I mean, this was going to be technology hardware. So you need the engineers, but then you also actually need capital that you, where you're going to actually create the, the physical material. And that requires a lot of money. So he thought, I'm going to do this in Istanbul where labor is much cheaper. Because Silicon Valley has become one of the most expensive places to live in the United States. And he had just become priced out. And he said, I'm going to do that because I know that they've got as qualified engineers in, in Istanbul. And he gets to Istanbul, and sure enough, he hires qualified engineers, people who have tremendous talent. So he's starting this company, but what problem does he run into? Everybody's waiting for him to tell him what to do. All these technologists who have tremendous talent, they don't have this initiative. They have never been in an environment where people ask them what they thought. They have never been in a an, working environment where people cared about what their ideas were. No, they had been used to working in an educational system, in a, a working environment, where people told them what to do. And they didn't understand what Bülent wanted them to do. So what Bülent realized is I can have the best technologists in the world if I don't actually have the the infrastructure to actually motivate them and incentivize them to actually take their ideas to scale, then this company's not going anywhere. So what he had to actually invest in was a lot of people in human resources and in management. And he brought those people in from outside to actually work on teams and build culture. When you walk into the AirTize office in Istanbul, one of the first things that you'll notice is that there's this board with a set of, there's 10 points there, and it talks about what the company's values are. And he would sit and he talked about these values in building this culture until people and those engineers would come into work and really take the initiative that, that he wanted to do. So that's my second lesson. Um, my third lesson is something that I've taken from Alan de Botain. I don't know if anybody reads um, his material in the Book of Life. And it's something that really resonated with me when I saw it. And the, the next lesson is, is confidence. And so this, I think, is the most essential ingredient for any entrepreneur. And I think that confidence is the single thing that's standing in the way of entrepreneurs here, Africa, Asia, or Latin America, and Silicon Valley. Confidence is not a given. You're not born confident. 
you develop confidence. And what was amazing to me is when I went around the world looking at the, at the various men and women and the companies that were starting, but then also spending time in Silicon Valley, what I realized is the greatest technologies and the greatest companies were not created by the smartest people. They weren't created by the best engineers. They were created by people who had confidence. So um, what, what made me realize that this is the most essential ingredient is, and we have an abundance of it in, in the United States and we're actually able to cultivate it, it's harder to do in a place like Egypt, right? Life is hard. You know, com you know, when your life is hard and you're working and you're an entrepreneur not because you have an idea or you have an opportunity, beca but because you have to survive, confidence is something that you can't actually cultivate. Confidence requires hope. So we talk, we throw these words around, we talk about hope and passion and vision and perseverance, and frankly, it's all bullshit because when you really get down to it, you have to really understand what people's lives are like. And for a long time, the lives of people, whether it's in Egypt or other places in the Middle East, in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, it was about survival. And when you're talking about survival, hope is a dangerous thing. So that's why I think most of your parents who actually had to go out there and set up their own businesses because they had to survive said, no, 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 you don't want to be an entrepreneur. You want to go work for someone. You want to get a real job because entrepreneurship is not a job. It's not going to create a job. I don't want you to survive. I want you to have a good life. So you have parents here in the Middle East. I certainly know that my parents definitely did not want me to do the things that I'm doing. Be not because my parents don't believe in me, but my parents want to protect me. So you're living in an environment like that, and that's really hard to actually develop confidence when you're, when you're under this pressure. I think the second thing that really distinguishes is the educational system. In the United States, we have an educational system that encourages free thought and, and creativity and analysis, and a lot of schools outside of the United States are about memorization and not talking back to the teacher and not questioning authority. And I think that that is the single most thing that distinguishes people in Silicon Valley or the United States from other places outside. Because I think for too long, Egyptians, like people in Africa, um, Asia, and Latin America, and throughout the Middle East, they didn't question authority. They had faith in the people who were running their governments, who were running their companies, who were running their schools. They had faith in that authority. And I have to say that, that entrepreneurship is not just about disruption of markets, it's about disruption of political systems and ways of thought. And I talk a lot about this when I talk about empowering women. Women have to think a little bit differently. They have to think about what their role is, and it's about, it's about, an, it's about a behavioral and an and a intellectual disruption. And what I saw, and where I saw that happen, I saw that happen in 2011 here in, in Tahrir Square, just a, just a few minutes away from here. Egyptians rose up and they said, halas, halas, enough. And let me tell you something, that was inspirational for me to see in Brooklyn, New York, because I thought here is a people that have, have come away where they believe in themselves enough to say, I want democracy and I want to have a better life and I want you to be accountable to me. And let me tell you something, if anybody tells you that the next Steve Jobs won't come from Cairo, you can tell them, you can tell them about the Arab Spring. We haven't, the story of the Arab Spring is not over. I know a lot of people are very fatalistic about it, but it is still being written and it is being written by you because you are the men and women that are actually determining the future and you're the men and women who are developing that confidence and, and building the businesses that are gonna be able to do it. <laughs> I wanna end, um, so um, I wanna end just reading the very last paragraph of my book, which I hope you all, you will all run out and buy now. Um, um, and I end it like this. Somewhere in the world, someone is working on something that will be the next Apple, eBay, Facebook, Google, Hewlett Packard, or Intel. The next great innovator, the next Steve Jobs, won't be from Silicon Valley, but will come from Mexico, Nigeria, 
Pakistan or Turkey. Indeed, the next Steve Jobs lives in one of those places today, including Cairo. Thank you.